I'll be talking about chronic rhinosinusitis. My disclosure, all speakers and members of the planning committee have no relevant financial relationships with the commercial interest to disclose. The objective of today's talk is to define chronic rhinosinusitis. I'm going to identify common comorbid conditions which affect treatment and exacerbate disease. We're going to review medical and surgical treatment options. And finally, I'll introduce biologic modifier therapy as an emerging treatment option for this patient population. CRS is defined as symptomatic inflammation of the sinonasal cavity persisting for greater than three months. It's the preferred term as opposed to just sinusitis. It's a heterogeneous condition with varying severity and common comorbidities. There's multiple etiologies, and it needs to be distinguished from recurrent acute rhinosinusitis. This is defined as four more episodes of acute inflammation without persistent symptoms in between episodes. Recall that acute rhinosinusitis is less than four weeks in duration. You have to have both symptomatic and objective drug criteria in order to make the diagnosis from a symptom standpoint. You need to have two or more of the following symptoms, nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, facial pain or pressure, or reduction or loss of smell. And you see here on this picture in the patient's left nasal cavity with pus draining into the back of their throat. You also have to have objective findings. On exam, the gold standard is the nasal endoscopy. And on, uh, you can also have imaging studies, and the gold standard would be CT imaging. So the indications for ordering a non-contrast CT scan are patients with a suspected complication from acute rhinosinusitis or to diagnose patients with recurrent or chronic rhinosinusitis or to look for an alter alternative diagnosis like a tumor. You want to check to see if the patients had a previous MRI scan and look specifically at the comment section regarding the sinuses. You also need to realize that the amount of inflammation on the CT scan does not correlate with symptom severity. And finally, the true prevalence of disease in patients with symptoms suggestive of chronic rhinosinusitis is 65 to 80 percent. Okay, this means that about a quarter of patients who have the symptoms of sinusitis do not have the disease, again, because they do not have inflammation on endoscopy or CT imaging. CS CRS affects one in eight adult, adults in the U.S. population. It results in greater than $11 billion per year in direct costs. It's the fifth most common reason for using an antibiotic and number one when combined with acute episodes. And patients with CRS visit their primary care doctor twice as often as patients without. These patients have poorer quality of life than patients with ang angina, COPD, congestive heart failure, or chronic back pain. It exacerbates comorbid disease like asthma, and patients with CRS have a higher risk of depression and anxiety. It has a significant economic burden in terms of not just reduced um, or absenteeism from work, but also reduced pro productivity while at work. So in 2015, our academy released updated guidelines with respect to acute and chronic rhinosinusitis. And a primary goal was to increase the diagnostic accuracy of chronic rhinosinusitis by requiring objective documentation. And that's what we just reviewed. A second goal was to distinguish chronic rhinosinusitis from other conditions with similar symptoms. And these conditions include primary headache disorders, TMJ disorder, various forms of rhinitis, and neoplasms. Of the primary headache disorders, it's commonly migraines that are most frequently misdiagnosed as chronic rhinosinusitis. So let's take a few seconds and review migraines. Okay, this was a study out of the Mayo Clinic up in Scottsdale where they looked at 46 patients with migraines. They all met the criteria for migraines. They all presented with sinus headaches. And you can see a majority of them, meaning greater than 70%, had post-nasal drainage, nasal congestion, or rhinorrhea. So when we look at symptomatic criteria for chronic rhinosinusitis, 42% of them met the symptomatic criteria for CRS. However, none of them had CRS because they did not have uh, inflammation on imaging. So a take-home point from this talk is that a poor response to rhinologic medical therapy should lead to an alternative diagnosis, and in fact, maybe a CT scan. And you can see the CT scan here, which is normal other than the deviated septum. The third highlighted issue was to distinguish chronic rhinosinusitis from patients with polyps and patients without polyps. About a third or a quarter of patients with, polyp or with chronic rhinosinusitis have polyps. This is a phenotypic distinction we need to contrast that with endotyping. Endotyping looks at the pathophysiology of the disease, 
in terms of chronic rhinosinusitis, there's three endotypes, and these are dictated by the T helper cell. So we have Th1 driven, which is neutrophilic, and without polyps, we have Th2 driven, which is eosinophilic inflammation, and these are patients primarily with polyps. And then a lesser common form is Th17, again, neutrophilic without polyps. This is a list of polyp subtypes, and the names aren't necessarily important, but what you need to realize is that not all polyps are equal. Some polyps are more resistant to treatment. Some polyps are more recurrent after uh, sinus surgery. Another important take-home point is that you need to have a high suspicion for a neoplasm in patients with unilateral polyps. There's a lot of controversy or confusion when it comes to uh, when, when you uh, talk about fungal sinusitis. Basically, there's three types of fungal sinusitis, and the first one we're going to talk about is invasive fungal sinusitis. This is an infection, usually in an immunocompromised patient. The fungus invades tissue and bone. It results in necrosis, and there's a high mortality rate. Surgery, uh, emergent surgery is often needed along with IV antifungal therapy. So this is a true infection. It's an acute process and no polyps. We contrast that with a fungal ball, which is seen here in the right cheek sinus. And this is a matted ball of fungus. It's not an infection. Usually there's no polyps and it's a chronic condition. This was one of the few types of chronic rhinosinusitis that you can cure with surgery. And the third type is called allergic fungal sinusitis. This is another chronic condition. These patients have a severe allergy to environmental fungus, and this results in severe nasal polyposis. Again, chronic condition, surgery and steroids are adjunctive measures and not cures. The fourth highlighted issue from the updated guidelines was to assess for comorbid conditions which affect management. This is a list of some of the comorbid conditions that we'll now talk about. The prevalence of allergic rhinitis is 40 to 80 percent in patients with CRS. Extensive sinus disease is associated with atopic disease in about four out of five patients. Polyp recurrence after surgery is significantly higher in allergy patients than patients without allergies. However, despite this literature, there is limited data to support the use of allergy immunotherapy as a method to improve uh, outcomes in CRS or recurrent acute rhinosinusitis. Asthma has a direct correlation with the severity of radiographic disease and the severity of the asthma. 84 to 100 percent of patients with severe asthma will have some form of radiographic sinus disease. Just like allergies, the revision rate for sinus surgery is much higher in patients with asthma than patients without. You also have improved uh, or medical and surgical treatment for chronic rhinosinusitis improves asthma symptoms and decreases medication use and hospitalizations. So another take-home point is that in asthmatics with difficult to control disease or difficult to control symptoms should be evaluated for chronic rhinosinusitis with a CT scan. CRS is reported in about one-third to two-thirds of cystic fibrosis patients. Nasal polyps can be the first manifestation of cystic fibrosis, especially in young people. CRS can also be found in about a third of cystic fibrosis carriers. So therefore, you want to check carrier status in refractory CRS patients. Immune dysfunction can be immunodeficiency, and here is a list of common immunodeficiencies associated with chronic rhinosinusitis. It can also be from an autoimmune condition, such as ANCA-associated vasculitis, like Churk-Strauss disorder, or Wegener's granulomatosis. Other causes are sarcoidosis and rheumatoid arthritis. So immunodeficiencies are risk factor for both a recurrent acute and chronic rhinosinusitis. About a third of patients with common variable immunodeficiency have chronic rhinosinusitis. And in patients with refractory chronic rhinosinusitis, at least a third have an immunoglobulin deficiency. So a take-home point is to consider immunodeficiency workup in refractory chronic rhinosinusitis patients or in patients with CRS with comorbid otitis media, pneumonia, or bronchiectasis. Immunodeficiency can be primary or secondary. In my practice, we're seeing a lot more secondary cases, and these can be from diabetes, HIV, or immunosuppressive drugs used to treat rheumatologic conditions, hematologic malignancies, or transplant patients. The immunosuppressive drugs to treat rheumatologic patients is a new area of study, and here is a list of drugs that we see associated with new onset chronic rhinosinusitis. The most common of these are tumor necrosis, tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors, such as Humira or Enbrel. These patients have similar physiology, pathophysiology to patients with neutrophilic inflammation, 
are our patients without polyps, and the treatment is to change or stop the immunosuppressive drug. High level of evidence is lacking for reflux as a cause of chronic rhinosinusitis, but these conditions are often seen together and share similar symptoms. Small case series suggests that there is a causal relationship. Findings from two different studies which, which suggest this causal, causal relationship are listed here. 95% of patients with recalcitrant chronic rhinosinusitis had a positive pharyngeal pH probe, meaning they had acid outside of their esophagus in the back of their upper, or in the upper airway. Okay, this is not a normal finding. They also demonstrated that post-nasal drainage symptoms are reduced in patients with a proton pump inhibitor when compared with a placebo. Low vitamin D levels are also associated with allergic rhinitis, asthma, and chronic rhinosinusitis. There's a significant association between low vitamin D levels and the polyp phenotype, and the disease severity, meaning the amount of polyp tissue, is inversely related to the amount of vitamin D deficiency. The final comorbid condition is odontogenic rhinosinusitis. This is an often underdiagnosed condition. Uh, these patients usually present with significant symptoms. It can be acute or chronic. It's defined as sinusitis induced by a dental lesion or dental procedure. And here's a list of the different causes. It's not usually as obvious as this case where on the, right, or the patient's right maxillary sinus where we see an ectopic tooth resulting in sinusitis. This is another form of chronic rhinosinusitis where surgery or treatment is curative. Considerable variation exists in terms of medical therapy because of the lack of evidence-based medicine. We often talk about failing adequate or maximal medical therapy before moving on to surgical options, and we're going to review the evidence-based medicine for medical therapy, then we'll talk about surgery. The gold standard for surgery is endoscopic sinus surgery. Less invasive options that can be done in the clinic include balloon sinuplasty, polypectomy, or placement of a drug eluding stent. Okay, from our academy guideline, updated guidelines, there are only two treatment options which they recommended based on evidence-based medicine, and that is saline rinses and topical nasal steroid. Saline rinses are low cost and low risk. They improve mucus clearance and ciliary activity and remove inflammatory mediators from the sinus. Okay, they've been demonstrated in Cochrane reviews to be beneficial, and so expert guidelines favor regular use. Topical steroid sprays are low cost and low risk also. They've been demonstrated to be effective in 18 randomized controlled studies. You also need to recall that the majority of these studies were in patients with polyps. No single agent was found to be more beneficial than another, so expert guidelines favor their use. Uh, just a comment on steroid rinses. We often use steroid rinses. This is used as off-label use of the medication, and expert guidelines cannot demonstrate or cannot make a recommendation for use because of the absence of evidence-based medicine. Topical antibiotics deliver high concentration of drugs directly into the sinuses, and this especially is important after surgery. There is limited data to support their use. However, larger randomized control trials are required in order to make the recommendation. Topical and systemic antifungal therapy has found to be not beneficial with limited placebo-controlled trials. A conclusion from the Co a Cochrane Review from 2019 noted that the benefit is uncertain and that further subgroup analysis is needed. In terms of our clinical practice guidelines, they specifically state that you should not use topical or systemic antifungal agents in treating CRS patients. And on the left here, we have a patient with allergic fungal sinusitis, and we're removing the fungal uh, debris from the sinus cavities. Systemic steroids have been found to be beneficial. In a Cochrane review, this demonstrated benefit with short courses defined as two to three weeks. They acknowledge that the improvement is gone in three to six months, and they note that no studies have looked at patients without polyps. Steroids are considered part of adequate or maximal medical therapy before we move on to surgery. As you're aware, steroids have significant side effects, and in our clinic, we consent patients, and we do this by documenting in the EMR that we discuss the risks with them, and we also provide them with a handout. Failure to provide informed consent is the number two reason for filing a lawsuit in steroid-litigated cases. One of the more common causes for litigation is steroid-induced avascular necrosis. This represents about 10% of total hip fracture replacement surgeries. It usually requires about a gram of cumulative dosing 
in order to cause this, but it's been reported as low as 100 milligrams. So pay spe specific attention to uh, telling patients about that condition. Systemic antibiotics are also controversial as they lack evidence-based medicine. Expert opinion suggests short courses for acute rhinosinusitis exacerbations. Okay, you can also use long courses of antibiotics that have anti-inflammatory properties. And this is very important. Some antibiotics have anti-inflammatory properties as opposed to antimicrobial properties. And our macrolides have been found to be beneficial in patients with neutrophilic inflammation or patients without polyps. And doxycycline has been found to be beneficial in patients with eosinophilic inflammation or patients with polyps. An acute exacerbation is defined as a sudden or transient worsening of pre-existing chronic symptoms. I would add that you need to have purulent nasal drainage in order to make the diagnosis of an acute exacerbation, again, in a patient with CRS. So expert opinions suggest short courses of culture-directed antibiotics, but there is no recommendation because of a lack of evidence-based medicine. Just a brief word or comment about leukotriene esterase inhibitors. Okay, these have had several uncontrolled studies suggesting benefits specifically in patients with both polyps and asthma. However, in March, a black, spot, a black box warning was issued from the FDA regarding neuropsychiatric events, which are listed here. So my advice is to avoid these drugs when used specifically for CRS. Endoscopic sinus surgery is indicated when adequate medical therapy fails. The goals of surgery are to restore ventilation and drainage and allow for access for topical medical therapy. There's greater than 250,000 cases per year at an average cost of $7,700. So here's a patient with unilateral sinusitis, and this is what they look like after surgery. There is good data to suggest long-term benefit, and here's a particular study where they looked at 10-year prospective data. Greater than 75% of patients demonstrated disease-specific quality of life improvement. However, about one in five patients reported that they did not receive the expected benefits. So surgery is good, but not perfect. And all, the same study also demonstrated improvement in treating asthma. And one of the important findings was it decreased the risk of developing asthma as compared to patients who proceeded with medical therapy alone. The revision rate for all people having surgery, or sinus surgery specifically, at 10 years was 17%. And when they looked just at polyp patients, that was 25%. So treatment options for patients with immunodeficiency include standard treatment like culture-directed antibiotics and sinus surgery. You can also use prophylactic antibiotics or IVIG replacement. There is no consensus or guideline for this patient population. In terms of studies, there was a study that demonstrated that IVIG reduced the frequency of infections, but this did not correlate to improved symptoms. There were eight studies looking at sinus surgery in patients with immunodeficiency, and these studies demonstrated improved quality of life and improved endoscopy and radiographic scores. Interestingly, the revision rate of surgery in this patient population was 14%, which is lower than normal. And finally, there were two studies looking at vitamin D replacement and the benefit it had on polyp burden. Okay, one study looked specifically at reducing polyp burden and the other study looked at reducing polyp recurrence in post-operative patients, again, just by replacing vitamin D in deficient patients. For the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about biologic modifier therapy, and this is a very exciting area of our field. In the last one to two years, these drugs have been demonstrating significant benefit. These are defined as substances manufactured from a living system that target specific parts of the immune system that fuel, fuel inflammation. So we know that they've been used successfully in patients with asthma and atopic disease. And as it pertains to these two conditions, they've been shown to be cost effective. So when we consider that these conditions have similar pathophysiology to patients with polyps, specifically type 2 inflammation, it makes sense that these patients would benefit from these treatments. Let's briefly review type 2 inflammation. The type 2 inflammation represents 80% of patients with polyps. We know that these patients have more severe and recurrent disease. Okay, one-third of these patient, of polyp patients are not controlled with standard of care therapy. And the key players in creating type 2 inflammation are eosinophils, IgE, and interleukin 4, 5, and 13. 
Here's a slide or diagram demonstrating that inflammation with specifically in sinusitis. Okay, inflammatory stimuli penetrate the epithelium. We see that the antigens get presented to dendritic cells, and from there it goes uh, by way of uh, three pathways. So the first pathway is type 1 or type 17 uh, inflammation, and this leads to neutrophilic inflammation or patients without polyps. On the right side of the diagram, you see type 2 inflammation, and this leads to activation of B cells, mast cells, and eosinophils, and this ultimately leads to polyps. But again, the key point here is you can see that on the right side, the key players are IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, and IgE. So to date, there's been 69 unique biologic modifier therapies developed. Zero have been looked at for patients without polyps. Five have been investigated for patients with polyps. And specifically, they're targeting IL-4, IL-5, and IgE. Now, these are anti uh, Antibody, or these are antibodies directed at these substances. And here's a list of the mechanism of actions of these five different monoclonal antibodies, but I want to highlight three of them, and that is Zolaire, Nucala, and Depixent. Okay? These three drugs have demonstrated benefit in randomized controlled trials in patients with polyps. And specifically, it decreased polyp burden based on endoscopy scores and subjective scores. And also, these, these drugs have significantly uh, a high safety profile in terms of their use. Very, very rare risk of a serious adverse reaction. I often tell patients this is like prednisone without the side effects. So of these three drugs, Depixent deserves special attention. It's the first and only biologic to be FDA approved for patients with polyps. And this occurred back in June of 19. Again, it's an IL-4 alpha receptor antagonist, so it works on both IL-4 and IL-13. Its effectiveness and safety was demonstrated in two placebo-controlled phase 3 studies with effects lasting up to 52 weeks. Not only did it improve polyp size and opacification on CT imaging and health-related quality of life measures, but it also reduced the need for systemic steroids by 74% and surgery by 83%. So in patients with asthma and polyps, it improved lung function and asthma control. So it's indicated as an add-on maintenance treatment in adult patients defined as greater than 18 years of age with inadequately controlled chronic rhinosinusitis with polyps. The main question is what defines inadequately controlled? Because they're new in our field, literature-based guidance for incorporation of these drugs into treatment options is lacking. So there's a few, long, or a few important questions that need to be asked with respect to these drugs. And one is the long-term effects, both bad and good. What about benefit in patients without polyps? What about pediatric patients defined as less than 18 years of age? Are allergic fungal sinusitis patients present in their early teens? What about combining drugs? Would patients receive more benefit if they use more than one? Do patients have to fail surgery? And most importantly, are they cost-effective? Uh, you need to understand that these drugs cost about $40,000 per year. Compare that with the $7,700 of an average sinus surgery. So ultimately, society is going to need to determine what it's willing to spend for patients to breathe well and smell again.